वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला हेलो आई एम अनुरेखा चारीवाग असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशोलॉजी सावित्री बाई फुले पुणे यूनिवर्सिटी आई एम कोऑर्डिनेटिंग द पेपर ऑन सोशोलॉजी ऑफ जेंडर टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द थ्योरी ऑफ इंटरसेक्शनैलिटी इन ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस थ्योरी ऑफ इंटरसेक्शनैलिटी वी विल ऑल्सो लुक इन टू द अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द नॉलेज ऑफ द टर्म सोशल रोल्स especially in the context of what it means to identities and feminism we'll also try to understand what class gender race and caste identities mean when they intersect with one another we will also try to understand what oppression and privilege means in relation to the above categories while trying to understand this theory of intersectionality we will also try to pay an intellectual debt to the black feminism especially in the context of black feminist movement and lastly we will also try to apply intersectionality and try to understand how we can apply that in our everyday lives theory of intersectionality intersectionality may be defined as an approach to analyze how social and cultural roles identities and categories intertwine to produce multiple axes of oppression what does this mean simplistically if you think about individual identities perhaps your own you know that the answer to the question who are you is complex you cannot describe yourself completely and effectively in a sentence neither can your gender religion social class or political affiliation tell the whole story of your life and self just as your identity constitutes a social role status personal history and future aspirations any individual or group identity has a similar multifaceted composition intersectionality is thus used as an important theoretical paradigm in sociology women and gender studies and critical race theory the complexity and compounding of social roles social processes and the histories that create various outcomes such as oppression and privilege cannot be understood by concentrating on one analytical category such as gender or one source of oppression such as powerful men and hetero patriarchal society we have to understand identity categories as entwined and social processes as intersecting patriarchy in a heteronormative society sometimes known as hetero patriarchy is such a hierarchical order that accepts and rewards people's gender expression identity and sexual orientation to be normal you are expected to be straight cis gender that is identifying with the gender given at birth marked and married at a suitable age and raise a family the social acceptance is contingent on not just gender expression and sexuality but also age and economic status having a career giving children a good and a stable home being a good citizen being healthy these are not merely issues of character and domination but they are also contingent on man's gender but other aspects of his identity you might notice that not all men dominate women not all women are oppressed and not all men are breadwinners and not all women are stay at home mothers the overarching theory of intersectionality help us to understand not just how social structures operate but also how we exercise our agency within given social structures it helps us to think critically and see clearly beyond the stereotypes and help us to understand not just oppression but also privilege intersectionality emerged from black feminist legal studies black feminist traditional studies marginalization from the perspective of race relations and racial domination it studies current social processes as rooted in african american history and the lived experience of marginalized races in the next section we will take up the intellectual legacy and the current theoretical work on intersectionality and learn about black feminist thought in the process section 1 history development and some major theoreticians the term intersectionality was coined by the feminist legal scholar kimberley crenshaw crenshaw wrote an article in 1989 titled demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex where she attempted to understand how a single categorical axis of oppression or discrimination race erases black women as a theoretical category and imports such erasure to legal reforms and activism 
she showed like other black feminists before her that black women are systematically excluded from feminist theory and sometimes anti-racist politics. Being a legal scholar, Crenshaw made her arguments through an analysis of three court cases. She outlined the problem of a doctrinal response to discrimination where the experience of racism must be aligned to black men's experience and the experience of sexism to white women's. Therefore, black women were protected only to the extent that their experiences coincided with the experiences of either two groups. They analyzed the claims of the plaintiff by using the records of white female employment as a historical base for the condition of female employment in the organization. Using many cases, she argued that in a very few cases where black women are allowed to use overall statistics indicating racially disparate treatment, black men may not be able to share in the remedy. What does it mean? Black women's blackness or femaleness continues to place their needs and perspectives at the margin of feminist and black civil rights agenda. The singularity of the burdens, one's race or sex or class, becomes the defining factor in rights theorization, jurisprudence and justice. This kind of monolithic thinking about identity places the most vulnerable in society as precarious positions from a policy as well as public opinion perspective. When you think about a poor village of mostly Dalit people as an activist or a policy maker, will you focus on the villagers caste oppression, their abject poverty, their segregation despite untouchability being illegal in India, the lack of educational and civil rights amenities in the village? Why not everything all at once? You might have to participate in solving one problem at a time, but if you see the problems as entwined and intersecting, it is likely that the people will tell you, it is always so. Always a good idea to work with people rather than for them based on your own preconceived assumptions. Chances are that you will have a clearer understanding of the situation. This is exactly what Crenshaw advocated. The problem of social justice, Crenshaw award is not a lack of political will, but a disturbing, uncritical acceptance of the dominant paradigm of discrimination, which adopts a single issue framework. The parameters of discrimination are tightly defined so as to make the process simplistic. This marginalizes people whose experiences cannot be explained through a singular axis of oppression. Crenshaw wrote, wrote about marginalized women in the United States. The theoretical framework, however, has universal applicability. Let us take a few step backs and understand the black feminist tradition that intersectionality emerges from. Patricia Hill Collins, eminent sociologist and theorist of intersectionality, states that black feminist thought demonstrates black women's emerging power as agents of knowledge. By portraying African American women as self-defined, self-reliant individuals confronting race, gender and class oppression, Afrocentric feminist thought speaks to the importance of that oppression. Afrocentric feminist thought speaks to the importance that knowledge plays in empowering oppressed people. Thus, black feminist standpoint is all about expanding the boundaries of feminist theories and activism and including multiple experiences, perspectives and standpoints in it. Feminist theory is not merely the domain of middle class white women, notice the intersectional categories or upper class academicians. Everyone's voices must be included lest we start believing in only one form of oppression, sexism, affecting one identity category. White women who wrote about their experiences that circulated in the academia and media as feminist consciousness. Collins emphasized the need for looking at race, class and gender as interlocking systems of oppression. This meant a radical revisioning of how we understand oppression and privilege collectively and individually. We all exist, Collins theorized, in a matrix of domination where structures of gender, race, ethnicity, class, age, religion determine our experiences. It is difficult to pry one structure apart and label it as most or least oppressive. Crenshaw has argued that mainstream feminist thought derives a lot of theoretical and di dialogical strength from the black woman's history and experiences, yet lessons from power oratory or writings such as 
Sojourner's Truth, Entire Woman, are never fully assimilated or applied in feminist intervention. The challenges to patriarchy embedded in black feminist writings could be useful to feminist theory, but feminist theory per se couldn't be useful to black women because written from a privileged white feminine perspective, the claims and premises were inapplicable and unresponsive to the women of color. The authoritative universal voice of the white woman is quite similar to that of non-racial, non-gendered, objective white man's. The feminist voices arising from a similar socio-cultural context concentrate only on gender but never on race. There is no understanding of different social, historical, economic and political context that shapes the lives within the black community where notions of men, women, power and patriarchy are differently understood and applied. Neither black liberation politics nor feminists that came together during the civil rights struggle of the 50s and the 60s America can ignore the intersectional experiences of those whom the movements claim as their respective constituents. There must be an understanding that the sources of oppression are multiply fused, often not clearly identifiable or explicable by prevailing singular paradigms. Crenshaw believed that a more effective language and framework needs to develop that recognize the intersection and those that are impaired by their location within. The issue is not so much of a political will than of a limited understanding of the life experiences shared by various forms of disadvantaged roles and identities. The existing discourse on discrimination needs to be revised and re-centered which would lead to more effective politics, policies and legislations. Till date she is promoting the usefulness of intersectionality as a powerful tool of sociological and legal analysis. In recent years, scholars such as Leslie McCall, Jennifer Nash have written about the complexity and significance of intersectionality. McCall has delineated three approaches to address the method of intersectionality. Anti-categorical complexity is based on a methodology that deconstructs analytical categories because social life is too complex, overflowing with multiple fluid determinations of both subjects and structures to make fixed categories anything but simplifying social fictions that produce inequalities in the process of producing differences. This approach has its roots in the feminist writings of 1980s when the hegemonic feminist theorists, post-structuralist, anti-racialist theorists almost simultaneously launched assaults on the validity of modern analytical categories. Deconstruction of categories such as women, gender, black was akin to deconstruction of inequality. Language was seen to create a categorical reality, not the other way around. The second approach, intra-categorical complexity, takes marginalized intersectional identities as an analytic starting point in order to reveal the complexity of lived experience within variously disadvantaged groups. This approach usually utilizes the case study method. The third method, inter-categorical complexity, requires that scholars provisionally adopt existing analytical categories to document relationships of inequality among social groups and changing configurations of inequality along and conflicting dimensions. Relationships and interactions between social groups and categories are more important than the fluid futility or importance of the categories themselves. Starting from traditional categories of identity, this approach appreciates that no single dimension of overall inequality can adequately uh, describe the full structure of multiple intersecting and conflicting dimensions of inequality. Jennifer Nash has taken the discussion on intersectionality beyond the methodological discussion to rethink its theoretical importance. She believes that intersectionality subverts race gender binaries in the service of theorizing identity in a more complex fashion. The destabilization of race, gender, binaries is particularly important to enable robust analysis of cultural sites. Intersectionality trains scholarships to come to terms with the legacy of exclusions of multiply marginalized subjects from feminist and anti-racist work and the impact of those absences on both theory and practice. Intersexuality by focusing on the ways in which differences between various social groups and categories are constructed is useful to understand how these differences become relevant 
to politics confronting simultaneity of oppression. Intersectionality argues for the new conceptualizations of categories and the role in politics rather than seeking an abolition of categories themselves. How can thus the categories of identity and history be reconceptualized? In the next section, we discuss three basic concepts within the theory of intersectionality that shed lights on it. If you are using intersectionality in your own analysis, activism or research, regard this section as a conceptual toolbox. Section 2. Basic Concepts Intersection Intersection is a notion that individual and community lives are located at a social location of intersecting identities. These identities can be race, ethnicity, gender, social class, religion, age, disability, nationality, geopolitical location and linguistic abilities. Feel free to add to the list as you know social, political, individual identities are numerous. Due to these intersections our identities are composite and contingent. Crenshaw explained the notion of intersections with her analogy of a traffic intersection or what is commonly known as traffic junction in India. Thus focusing on one aspect of identity means creating a simplistic notion of singularity of the burden of oppression and taking an either or approach. A both approach could work better. Applying intersections as visual clarifies issues of intersectionality and signifies feminist theories moving away from the difference similarity approach towards an explanation of relational and interlocking processes. To understand identities at, at an intersection is to focus on the ways in which the differences between various social groups and categories are constructed as well as to understand how these differences become relevant to politics confronting simultaneity of oppression. Interlocking axis of oppression. This expression means that oppression is constantly being supported by systems of privilege and that multiple identities entwine to produce this oppression and or privilege. For Patricia Hill Collins, this concept is a way to understand how race, gender and class intersect to produce oppression at an individual and institutional levels. Interlocking access of oppression also account for the fact that individual community is located in a matrix of domination whereby they derive some reward and penalty for being located in various intersections, sometimes complying and sometimes resisting and sometimes undecided, immobile, neutral. Intersectionality thus sensitizes one to the hegemonic moves that legitimize the concept of a self-referencing unified subject of modernity by emphasizing that the different dimensions of social life cannot be separated out into discrete and pure strands. Identities within the matrix of domination. Interlocking systems of racism, sexism, classism, etc. strengthen the layer and complex systems of oppression such as patriarchy, capitalism and colonialism. Patriarchy as one knows is a system where males means power and control in a society. Therefore, the system of patriarchy is contingent upon people fulfilling social expectations tied to their gender and sexuality. As mentioned earlier in the chapter, social class is also central to one's appropriate patriarchal performance. Since patriarchy and heterosexism or heterosexuality as the only normal way of being goes hand in hand, scholars and activists use the term heteropatriarchy often. Capitalism as we all know is about free markets and perfect competition that thrives on the labor of the unfree, the slaves, low wage workers, the lower caste. Capitalism is a system of domination that creates and encourages discrimination in the form of racism, sexism and ageism. Notice how systems of oppression interact and intersect. Patricia Hill Collins and Bell Hooks, back feminist scholars, explain this phenomenon by the term actors of domination and politic of domination respectively. Varied forms of oppression for bell hooks comes together like a house they share the foundation, but the foundation is the ideological beliefs around which notions of domination are constructed. Section 3. Intersection of gender, caste, religion and class in India. As you know, issues of religion and state, nationalism and democracy can rarely be separated in India. Issues of women's rights are in extremely connected with issues of social class and developmental paradigms, the caste system and caste politics, religion and religious fundamentalisms, and issues of gender and globalization. 
Let us look at the issue of uniform civil code, henceforth UCC affirmative actions and women's movement in India intersectionally. How can we use intersectionality to analyze the non-implementation of the civil code? UCC has organized and unified two kinds of social movements in India, the women's movement and the religious fundamentalists of the Hindutva movement. Another stakeholder is the changing ruling regime at the center. It is interesting to note that while feminist legal activists in India have been demanding a UCC, a demand that has brought various factions of women's movement in India together in rare movements of consensus, contemporary feminist legal activism has distanced itself from the UCC debate. 1950s feminist demands for more egalitarian laws led to the secularization of various Hindu laws resulting in Hindu Code Bill and Hindu Marriage Act. The state continued to make changes in the Hindu laws and there is a history of case laws that attempts to balance between the fundamental right of religious expression and freedom and issues of women's rights and human rights. However, in spite of leanings towards a UCC that will standardize civil laws and eliminate traditional oppression of women in all religious communities, no ruling regime attempted to actually go down the path of introducing a bill and amending the constitution to make a UCC a reality. The barriers are enormous. The simplistic idea that the best legal practices from various religious laws are to be codified as one common body of law applicable to all citizens is clearly problematic. Religious groups, spiritual practices and belief systems in India are deeply heterogeneous. Our uneven democracy is marked by insoluble diversity. Uniform civil code is often posited as an issue of gender and religion, but what about regional variations in gender relations and religious practices? How can we unify those? Historically in India, women's groups and feminist activists have recognized gender justice in these laws and have demanded secular and uniform laws. However, since the groundbreaking Shah Bano case in 1986, the women's movement has had to shift its position because Hindu right lobbied for the imposition of the uniform code and linked this demand with the majoritarian politics of Hindu fundamentalist domination. With that, the broad ideological consensus that the women's movement has achieved in the 90s, 70s and the early 80s broke down. While a section of the movement, including Muslim women's organization, denounced the outcry arguing that Muslim personal law was indeed oppressive in nature, another section denounced the judgment itself as anti-Muslim rather than pro-woman. This stirred up existing debate that waged right from independence about personal laws being the site of constitutional contradictions between fundamental rights to religious communities and minorities and fundamental rights of women as citizens. Intersectionality can problematize the binaries and essentialist identity categories in the UCC debate, namely gender, religious affiliation, class, caste, and as it has become clear in the Shah Banu case, the notions of age and motherhood. Shah Banu finally did not accept the maintenance the court awarded her. It seems that she publicly retracted from the Supreme Court judgment for the cause of being a sincere Muslim first. Thus, she chose poverty over excommunication. Recent movements against gender violence in India focus just not on gender but also location, caste, and class. Every cause taken up by the women's movement in India, anti-price, anti-dowry, violence, anti-rape culture, to name a few were rarely ever just about women or just about gender. In terms of affirmative action embodied in the Women's Reservation Bill, there have been caste-based opposition as well as support. Some people who were seemingly opposed to the Mandal Commission are enthusiastic about women's reservation, a step towards inclusion and representation of women in democracy. During Mandal Commission, many people seem opposed to it from the standpoints of caste, meritocracy and social class. Some people, including sociologists such as E.S. Ghure, found reservation to be anti-nationalist and patronizing and moved towards reminiscent of colonial divide and rule. Sociologist Sujata Patel noted how caste as a crucial identity category of analysis was glossed over in the social science literature on the Mandal Commission. Patel has argued how the violent, fatal, suicidal protest against reservation manifest a crisis of social formation in India, who where agents are juxtaposed and pitted against the other by the state or people in power. This crisis has its roots in the anti-colonial nationalist mobilizations whereby religion, caste and class become salient identities 
and they are connected sociologically through theories of communalism, casteism and reservation. Yet economics and theories of development are legitimized as a focus of Indian nation state and the aforementioned identities as legitimized in political ideology and mobilization. This theoretical and embodied instability can be analyzed through the theory of intersectionality. Sometimes it is difficult to separate politics, standpoints and identities and intersectionality points out at the possibility of studying them as a compounded crisis of a democracy with many colonial features intact. To conclude the theory of intersectionality module, I would say that this module really discusses about these issues of identity, categories, intersection, especially in terms of oppression. We also discussed about very, very clearly about the whole matrix of domination that shows how inequality and oppression are not in terms of singular categories, but they are multiple and they intersect with one another. Using this whole idea in terms of race, caste, class, uh, patriarchy, gender, sexuality, we also discussed about how heteropatriarchy could also be understood in terms of intersection. Last but not the least, I think the important aspects of this theory of intersectionality is to make visible the invisible interlinkages, especially in systems of oppression.